do this, which isn't a phone commercial, but if everybody could take out their phone and turn it off, please, for the next hour and a half, it would be great. It's a small room and it can be a disruption. Thank you for that. Uh, it's a pleasure, of course, to welcome, uh, to welcome Ram back in the building, um, who was last here a little over a year ago, on January 30th, 2006, and I thought I would do this introduction very briefly with a quote by Rem for the way in which he opened up the conversation that we held last year with Peter Eisenman. And let me just read briefly from that quote. Uh, and this is Rem speaking. Basically, I can do architecture as a journalist, and journalism, of course, is a profession without discipline. It is only a regime of curiosities and applicable to any subject. And I would say that this is still a very important issue in my drive in architecture. I came to architecture, which is curiously a way too old subject, and as he said, something like 4,000 years old sometimes, uh, at exactly the moment when the world became the subject in architecture. <coughs> and I think the one thing that Rem didn't give away that evening was, of course, out of sheer modesty, the fact that as much as we were all ready for the idea that the world could become architecture, it's happened because of his activities more than any other individual, thinking, working, building, teaching, and considering the topic of architecture in the world today. <clears throat> since, seeing, um, since seeing Rem last year here that evening, he's been spotted a few times in the building since. Um, and it's inevitably the case that about two minutes into one of those spottings, word filters up to the second floor where I work, and what's known as a REM alert is usually sounded. Um, and someone will run up and quite breathlessly say, REM is in the building, and look at me. Um, and, and I'm never, I have to say, never quite sure what to do. Um, it, it definitely confirms that the director's office is somewhere between a valet and concierge service. Um, most of those visits, Rem simply wants to get on with the work. He'll sometimes use rooms in this building, as he does in many other buildings around the world, simply to get on with the task that he's set for himself, which is to rethink the way in which architecture can connect to that larger world. The last Rem alert that I received was last December, on an evening when we invited in to the building for the first time in three decades, Cristiano Toraldo di Francia, uh, and I was running late that evening, arrived five or ten minutes into the talk and turned to my right and Ram and Madeline were sitting in the audience as the students that they still are and were here not so long ago. Um, and as students do, took notes, scribbled thoughts, whispered stories and, uh, and asked a few questions afterwards. Made a few confessions, I think, at one point in the evening. And, uh, I think more than anything, and it was only afterwards that Madeline mentioned to me that in fact Rem had flown overnight from Hong Kong, come straight from the airport, had a swim next door in the Y, and ran in here three minutes before the lecture started. More than anything, and I think for all of the students that are here, um, the lesson in all of that, of course, is that when you set the task as making the entire world about architecture, what it really means is you make the world a thing that you're constantly learning, thinking, and more than anything, moving through. And it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome Rem back and for us to keep learning the lesson of that kind of movement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, really generous uh, introduction. Um, it, it's a bit uh, disappointing to hear you quote myself uh, a year ago. I apologize uh, in retrospect. Um, I don't know how this lecture turns out uh, because it is kind of really about uh, recent work uh, among uh, other things. Uh, so without further ado, let me kind of simply uh, dive into it. Um, architecture used to be like this. Uh, simply, it used to be civic, uh, it used to be monumental, and it used to express values. Then this regime happened, uh, as we call the market economy, uh, the combination of the yen, the euro, and the dollar, uh, giving you the word yes. Uh, and then architecture became like, oh my god, it's not going to be one of those days. Uh, architecture turned out like this. And if we describe this, uh, I would say it's eccentric, uh, individualistic, uh, not necessarily about um, civic values, but uh, about uh, largely imported values. 
and clearly uh, kind of a result of globalization. Uh, this is a recent collage. It's basically the uh, a collage that a skyline that you get if you combine the collective work of the thinking part of the architecture profession of the last 10 years in a single image. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's very exciting, uh, uh, and, and of course, and don't exclude ourselves from this. This is another kind of important uh, thing that happened in the market economy. If you look at the income of movie stars, it exploded. Of pop stars, it exploded. Of art stars, it exploded. Of sports stars, even script writers. But the kind of line of uh, architects is stubbornly horizontal. Uh, even if there is a kind of modest uh, stratosphere uh, which is formed by Gary and Foster. So what is truly embarrassing is that we make the icons for the market economy, that, but that otherwise we don't benefit from the market economy. But we don't earn money, but we earn insane amounts of attention. Uh, this is Peter Eisenman. Uh, 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 like a hunted deer uh, kind of in, in the center of his monument uh, uh, in Berlin, uh, really pursued by uh, maybe paparazzi uh, or whatever the equivalent of the architecture press is, or maybe it is now paparazzi. Um, and uh, this kind of occasion is quite frequent, and I think that uh, we are in a paradoxical situation that we uh, get insane amounts of attention, but that we are not necessarily taken seriously. Very wrenching kind of feeling. And also that attention uh, is sometimes uh, uh, embarrassing uh, in the sense that you never know whether you are kind of actually a salesman uh, or uh, an intellectual. Um, more and more, uh, I try to... Um, become an intellectual, kind of public intellectual, simply to escape uh, from the confines uh, of architecture. Here in debate uh, with Peter Sloterdijk, uh, usually with terrible moderators who can really ruin everything. Um, so, escape from architecture, but uh, later in the lecture you will kind of really realize that uh, that is a kind of illusion and, and that uh, we are currently uh, exploring a return to architecture. But anyway, uh, an intellectual and also active in politics, uh, or at least trying to develop, uh, in spite of the confines, again, of architecture, the, uh, the profession as it is currently defined, uh, a political role. Uh, so far, our most ambitious effort has been to uh, work for Europe and to work uh, to make the uh, European uh, entity and the European unity uh, something worth representing and something worth uh, uh, adhering to or believing in. Uh, this is a very old poster uh, about what Europe is about and actually a very intelligent poster because it takes care of so many of the phobias. Europe is a cause that is propelled by a series of individual countries that don't have to fear for their individuality uh, and uh, get a kind of additional imaginary space, uh, 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 kind of extra identity uh, as a benefit from their association. We translated it in this kind of barcode which starts with Ireland and kind of then ends as far east as, as Europe eventually will go as a kind of really modern kind of uh, effort uh, for that and kind of something fundamentally more inspiring than this kind of insipid and, and mute uh, emblem that we have so far. Uh, we made an exhibition in Brussels kind of that told the history of Europe. Uh, there I was in contact with politicians, the president of Europe, Roman Apodi, who nobody knows uh, in the rest of the world, uh, nobody knows in the rest of the world, one of our uh, deep uh, embarrassments or problems. Uh, and recently that uh, tent and that exhibition uh, traveled to Vienna, uh, where it was uh, erected on the very site where Hitler signed uh, the Anschluss as a kind of form of pretty drastic assertion of a new condition. And the kind of Viennese also uh, adopted our uh, aesthetic and, and in even our flag. Uh, to the ironic point that we now have uh, uh, this kind 
of, you know, in, in my previous career, it would always have uh, been a collage or a kind of Photoshop. Uh, but but uh, in this case, it is actually uh, real. Uh, uh, and the fact that we made it this far is, uh, uh, in, in terms of our uh, uh, ambition, uh, a really significant uh, moment. But maybe that is kind of really uh, kind of private, private comment, and that the significance is not that visible to others. But for me, that architecture can infiltrate, uh, even if it is a kind of almost viral way, the kind of aesthetics uh, and, and, and the mise-en-scene of politics is very important. Anyway, um, uh, Bush and Blair uh, basically made some choices, and I think that those choices changed the world, kind of partly for the worse, presumably, uh, but perhaps also partly for the better. Uh, basically, I think that what their choice uh, surrounding the kind of issue of 9-11 kind of really split globalization perhaps in two phases. Uh, globalization one is the globalization which is driven by America. And uh, in my kind of political expectation, uh, globalization two is globalization without America as a leader. And that is a particularly interesting moment. So what I think 9-11 plus Blair did is kind of really fracture uh, the world uh, but and, and, and kind of withdraw, except from Iraq, of course, uh, America's attention. Uh, but what the potential interest of that situation is, is that the kind of abandoned part, which is, of course, the largest part, now has a serious and interesting uh, issue. Uh, which is, you know, how to uh, come to terms with this new uh, orphan situation and, and how to make the best of it and how to kind of reinterpret uh, itself as a kind of single entity. Ironically, uh, it is very close to uh, Ptolemaeus the, uh, and Herodotus, uh, the kind of world as it was then uh, kind of known, Europe, Asia, uh, and the kind of northern part of our, uh, Africa. Uh, as a kind of single entity, and I interestingly enough, after 2,000 years, we seem to be going to back to this condition where Europe, Russia, China, India, and, and the Middle East have to find a new uh, way of coexisting. We, we know the clumsiness with which Europe itself has learned to coexist among itself, and I think that we are in for a new round of, of the same intense negotiations between all these kind of different uh, parts. Um, we are not equal uh, and, and we differ in many uh, ways, but of course we are condemned to each other and uh, that condemnation will, in my view, uh, require in the next decades a kind of constant redefining uh, and rediscussion and negotiation about a number of issues. Uh, human rights, corruption, freedom of speech, free trade, nuclear arms, and copyright. I mean, this is only the beginning, but I think that uh, our, even 10 years ago, we were totally confident, for instance, uh, among ourselves in, in knowing what human rights are in this situation or knowing what copyright is in this situation, but I think, uh, of, or freedom of speech, uh, I think that increasingly, for instance, if you take corruption, we are now aware that corruption exists everywhere, uh, also here, uh, also in the rest of Europe, and that therefore we are not exempt uh, of uh, the kind of same abuses that we have uh, in previous decades accused the others of. Uh, so maybe a new modesty uh, can be the beginning of a kind of genuine uh, communication between uh, and, and negotiation between all these uh, unequal parts. Uh, perhaps also um, kind of abandoning and, and dismantling the uh, incredible uh, uh, position of the individual uh, to more kind of intelligent forms of um, of collaboration. Now, basically, you can look at our work in many different ways. Uh, you can look at it as a kind of series of uh, opportunisms uh, as a very sincere effort to maintain certain standards, but you can also see it as a kind of political effort, which is to contribute to this process of negotiation, 
in terms uh, by participating in architectural efforts in this, not the silk route exactly, but I call it the silk zone. Uh, basically, this belt which connects all these regimes, which is a kind of fault line between all the kind of edges, and, and by exposing ourselves in a very deliberate way to interventions and to uh, contact and into the kind of inevitable compromises that are necessary in this largely kind of authoritarian, in different manners, uh, territory. So, that is kind of really what I kind of want to talk about tonight, you know, our experiences in that effort. Now, uh, the press is not particularly eager or, or particularly enthusiastic about this. Um, basically, this is just a kind of very typical, the buildings of evil, St. Petersburg, Beijing, Dubai, the stars of the international architecture work with enthusiasm for tyrants and autocrats. Yes, maybe. Uh, so, Yes, we uh, made a kind of proposal and won a competition uh, for this headquarters of Central China Television. Uh, but for us, of course, it's not important, not that important what the building is. For us, it is really critical that the building is actually a diagram and that the diagram kind of uh, superimposes on a series of studios, uh, a tower for broadcasting, a tower for script writing, uh, some section for administration, but most importantly of all, a kind of path, a loop in which the Chinese public is for the first time present in the heart of Chinese media making. And uh, it is therefore also incredibly kind of exciting to be aware that actually the effect of the building itself has now uh, forced the Chinese to kind of really consider what its implications are and will be and decided that the Central China Television, which used to be the station of the state uh, and which conveyed the message of the state, undoubtedly also because of the pressures of globalization, also because of the fact that it now has a 24-hour news station in English, which kind of forces it also to uh, increase the quality of its uh, notes making has decided in a very clever and Chinese way that the old building will remain and will be one half of a now split CCTV. The old building will keep conveying the state messages and the new building will be a kind of modern media company kind of based on uh, BBC. So this was one of the reasons that we felt we could participate uh, in this effort and were expecting and where we could promote it this outcome, uh, an outcome of a kind of schizophrenic perhaps, but in my uh, sense very intelligent uh, uh, effort to, um, to live or, or to operate in the kind of current uh, situation without abandoning uh, of course uh, the core uh, values and rules of the game in China. Um, a similar uh, effort, but kind of this time kind of much more flawed, perhaps, uh, was our participation in a competition uh, that we, in this case, uh, lost for the headquarters of Gaz Gazprom. Gazprom is the Russian oil company, kind of which is extending its uh, tentacles uh, across Europe, Middle East, Russia, and in, in, in the future. Since uh, China, and uh, of course is seen as a kind of very ominous entity. This is a lovely kind of Russian children's drawing kind of about Gazprom, which shows it kind of extending its <laughs> tentacles uh, across the world and, and, and uh, very eloquent in terms of its uh, ambition. And of all cities, Gazprom kind of wanted to be in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg is of course the par excellence historical city uh, protected by uh, the status of a World Heritage uh, Site and Gazprom before any architect had been kind of active uh, already decided that it needed a 300 uh, meter building just outside the ring of protection. So here again the press was not very enthusiastic, Russian death, Gazprom city 2, the 300 meter tall that kills the city and that was only one of the modest things. For me Nevertheless, being in Russia was kind of very important uh, to make a serious effort. 
being in uh, Petersburg, um, it was clear that the building had to be delicate uh, with the ground. And being very tall, it was clear that it had to be delicate with the sky. And so what it is, is a series of 12 towers. Uh, the blue part is mass and the clear part is transparent or non-existent. And so basically the Gosform building is simply all those 12 individual towers uh, jammed together and kind of put in a single kind of entity, which then has a barely occupation of the ground and kind of barely occupation of the sky and it kind of is simply a floating uh, irregular mass, you could say, uh, a kind of phantom. Uh, we wanted to make it of ice, uh, but uh, that was infeasible, uh, even with Arab. And uh, then we decided to <laughs> Uh, we decided to work in uh, ice, call it glass block, uh, so that uh, that would have given the whole kind of quality this, again, dreamy uh, uh, condition. There you see it. Now, uh, I mentioned that uh, we have uh, unbelievable amounts of attention, and that attention is kind of very often uh, humiliating rather than flattering. Uh, Basically, all the architects had to present their own thing kind of in, in five minutes in presence of the press. And so we started with Liebeskind, who had kind of, this was the, uh, his building. He has recently worked for the Korean car company Hyundai. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, Pierre de Mon. Um, and, and this is their building, which goes very well with the kind of Russian curtains uh, behind it. <laughs> um, and, um, and this was kind of how harsh and tough the kind of competition between international architects uh, is now. Basically, overnight, uh, in the Herzog and Dumoulin exhibit, uh, appeared this panel, uh, which efficiently crossed out. This is their building, which uh, was spared uh, an elimination. But then it, uh, they categorically included all the alternatives and crossed them out. <laughs> uh, I think that is a kind of really new condition uh, but, uh, between uh, architects and friends that they are literally so eager to win at all costs that, 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 this, that they're honest uh, and, and that part of it uh, I deeply appreciate. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> about the aggression and uh, kind of utter lack of uh, solidarity. Um, so on this journey, we move kind of further to Kazakhstan, uh, another kind of interesting country. In this case, uh, again, authoritarian, uh, perhaps uh, even to the point that the current president is an elected former boss of the Communist Party, but at the same time, an unbelievably kind of beautiful country. Uh, as large as Europe, uh, as you see here, uh, but com complete uh, inhabited by 13 uh, million people only, and with a kind of fantastic uh, past uh, as a Russian uh, colony, you could say. What is kind of deeply touching is that Russians have made such incredible efforts to, in, in the kind of far uh, corners of their kind of former empire, the Soviets, to create uh, conditions of planning uh, and conditions of kind of socialist living uh, and socialist housing and socialist accommodation. This picture is for me heartbreaking in its uh, sincerity. For others, it, it's probably heartbreaking in terms of its kind of authoritarianism, but um, now they are lucky to go from here to here. Uh, and the, uh, our client uh, has this headquarter um, and this uh, meeting room uh, and our client uh, is, is in the oil business and therefore is part of the liquidity and the client can wants to build a campus in uh, a very uh, beautiful part of nature, 80 kilometers from the Chinese border. This is the Virgin Territory. Uh, there is already some encroachment of a ski resort, uh, uh, not in a kind of very particularly beautiful, elegant. And the former uh, head of uh, the school is, is part of the advisors uh, of the client. 
So basically, we imagined uh, a campus here uh, in, in various versions, this version or that version, uh, aware of the incredible obligation to create something uh, important and significant, uh, and therefore thinking uh, in terms of mostly trying to lift things uh, off the ground and investigating kind of what kind of program could, could be accommodated in what kind of particle. Um, this is the kind of campus in summer, and this is the campus in winter. Uh, and this is the message we got from the client. So, one of the truly kind of hilarious uh, things is that, uh, although of course people want kind of new and modern architecture, and want to make a break with the past in such countries and such regimes. The kind of language and the communication is still, you know, kind of worthy of CIA and KGB. So our client Azamat uh, Ashmirov says, Richard, I've got marked copies which you gave me proving the evidence of agreement. It's strange to see your resistance. I will report the issue to Yerma. <laughs> uh, and so, um, so uh, all those um, things are then kind of part and parcel of that effort. So worth on, our, on this journey of engagement with um, worlds that we uh, also belong to and uh, that uh, are our neighbors uh, on the Eurasian continent, we now come in the kind of Middle Eastern part of, of the kind of work uh, and, and basically in this kind of region uh, which is defined by the Emirates, which is kind of five or six individual countries that share space and that are actually very close together uh, on the Gulf. Essentially, uh, it's very hard to read a certain poetry or a certain beauty in this uh, world, but, but I tried kind of from time to time from my hotel balcony. This is the Dubai in the fog. But of course, the main critical apparatus uh, of the kind of Western architecture world, which may be the kind of last domain where we uh, uh, are in control, uh, rather than the architecture itself, has already made up its mind about Dubai. Uh, yet the future that he's building in Dubai to the applause of billionaires and transnational corporations everywhere looks like nothing so much as a nightmare of the past. Walt Disney meets Albert Speer on the shores of Arabia. Mike Davis, somebody I really respect, but uh, nevertheless, I want you to remind and um, remember this kind of formula. W Disney, of course, Disney was American, uh, meets Abu Shapir, European on the shores of Arabia. So it's funny that for c a critic can say no worse, can invent no worse formula than to combine the worst of America with the worst of Europe. Anyway. It, it was strangely resonant uh, for me with kind of William Gibson's also American kind of criticism of uh, Singapore in Wired uh, roughly 10 years ago. So Disney with the death penalty. So my question is, you know, why is it that our foremost critics kind of uh, consider all these events so negatively and why do they think that they can um, use clever one-liners to uh, undo, uh, let's say, any more profound engagement uh, with this kind of condition. Uh, we have been, apart from uh, architectural activities, have been kind of trying to look into this whole uh, situation. We had an uh, entry in the Venice Biennale last year, and recently we have been kind of working on Almanac, which is a kind of brief history of the entire region where we're trying to look kind of more seriously, you know, at, at these Disney's who are obviously not Disney's but Sheikh's uh, and not no Albert Speer inside, but, but I'll talk about that later. Who uh, had the kind of obligation and the opportunity uh, in the early 70s, uh, the time that they for the first time became rich and which uh, significantly enough we call the oil crisis, uh, the opportunity to really consider what to do with their countries and how to uh, transform their countries and how to help their countries arrive in the kind of new 
situation we compared with the global system. It really was desert uh, and, and still is largely desert. And, and so those were the kind of first moment moments of kind of modern infrastructure being kind of projected on the desert. Quite serious architectural efforts, uh, even in Dubai, uh, we discovered, but also from the very beginning, a kind of large mobilization of surprisingly serious architects, uh, such as Wada Izazaki in Qatar, uh, able to kind of recycle uh, and, and remind himself of kind of early parts of his work, but also people like uh, Utzon, the architect of the Sydney Opera Hall, uh, who did the uh, uh, Kuwait Parliament, and also uh, quite beautiful uh, architectures like this, which have been built here, and also serious planning, uh, actually, uh, that was quite close to and referred to the kind of vernacular of the Arab world. Even now, and in the kind of modern age, of course, this is not the zone of the kind of easy caricature or the kind of devastating one-liner but basically an area that is uh, very seriously trying to educate its um, uh, population uh, by uh, intense associations uh, with uh, major educational institutions and that is trying to build uh, even though the kind of buildings are sometimes quite funny. Now, one of the things we were totally kind of devastated to discover is that there are major architectural offices that nobody has ever heard of, uh, like this one that uh, have kind of enormous staffs, I think this one of uh, 1500, Atkins, uh, can anybody who has heard of them can raise their hand? Okay, that's very impressive, five people. Uh, uh, f 15,000 people uh, working in the Middle East and kind of producing skylines uh, such as this one. And uh, then other uh, offices again with kind of colossal staffs and producing these skylines. Now the skylines together, kind of put together, are to me very interesting because at some point, and, and this is my prediction, that uh, this um, kind of anonymous architectural office will create or introduce a new uh, democracy in architecture and uh, is the beginning of the end of the star architecture system because their production is totally equivalent to, to our production uh, and that therefore the uh, invisibility of the difference uh, kind of will uh, maybe uh, eliminate this uh, incredible neurosis. Uh, and the beauty is that kind of for instance this is a skyline where Zaha is not a kind of eccentric kind of intruder, but actually uh, a kind of welcome uh, and complicit uh, participant. Uh, now, if we look at these uh, kind of architects, uh, and, and what is kind of ironic, kind of rather than um, Disneyland uh, planned by Robert Speer, all this architecture is actually, m most of this architecture is actually made by people like you and me. Enormous numbers of people from uh, Australia uh, kind of produce day in, day out in conditions that are very similar to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, uh, metal sheds on uh, overheated beaches uh, and desert parts. Uncounted numbers of kind of architecture. This is Atkins slash Foster slash, kind of you name it, uh, in uh, Dubai, and what they produce is our architecture shapes that are that don't work quite, uh, in the sense that you know from any but the most intended uh, and deliberate perspective, they they are quite awkward. This is a building 300 meters tall, but it looks like 12 stories somehow. Uh, but uh, what they have succeeded is to really erase the kind of difference, and together they are kind of forming and, and working on this, producing this kind of pleasure garden where slowly but surely the model of the city and the essence of the city is no longer uh, a place where you work or where you encounter, but it's kind of more like a resort, uh, a kind of place of uh, entertainment, provisional entertainment and temporary entertainment. And that status, I think, is now, uh, will, will be perhaps a triumphant outcome of the 21st uh, century. Um, 
this kind of landscape speaks for itself and, and these are the laborers on that landscape, all people like you and me, uh, people very often kind of graduated from the major Ivy League institutions. Uh, one in ten is a Harvard graduate, yet complicit. So actually it's much worse than Albert Speer, it's us who are doing it, uh, to be frank. Yeah? <laughs> Um, so how to operate in that condition? Uh, how to operate in this condition? So how to operate in this condition, which is kind of perhaps the most, well clearly this is our first involvement in the kind of Middle East. We had to kind of build, and we in this case is myself and the Mexican architect Fernando Donis. Uh, we had to build here uh, uh, a new building uh, that should be the center of a development there called Business Bay. Uh, now, we felt we needed to do something new. Uh, the client had already decided, uh, in this case too, that it had to be a 300 uh, meter building. 300 meter is the new uh, norm. Uh, and so we projected a uh, kind of single 300 meter shape uh, out of white concrete uh, that was 200 meter wide and 300 meter tall. Uh, it had a pattern. Uh, uh, and sometimes the pattern uh, suggested three-dimensionality and sometimes it had three-dimensionality. Uh, it was uh, 21 meters n narrow, so hugely big, and so our belief is and was that this is a kind of centerpiece uh, in a kind of typically contemporary collection of skyscrapers would at least assert a very strong presence also kind of next to the uh, Burj Dubai with which it was kind of futile to compete. <laughs> Actually, the building was interpreted as kind of lifting a part of old Dubai uh, with its kind of varied uh, programs and turned it into offices, hotel, and housing, interrupted by three lobbies uh, in which urban life took place. Uh, we had deals with the Serpentine and the Tate, uh, 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 here, we worked here with uh, Anish Kapoor and here with uh, Konstantin Grigic. Uh, so this is Kapoor's uh, <laughs> business one. And, and the, the more interesting collaboration was with uh, Konstantin Grigic, uh, who, where we started to kind of really explore uh, what kind of hybridizations and what kind of mutual benefit uh, in terms of aesthetic, aesthetic uh, power could be derived from the engagement rather than the infiltration. Now, this was the kind of position uh, of the building in the center, and we only felt we had to add one kind of single uh, additional feature, and uh, we came to the conclusion that we should make the building uh, turn. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in the sense that uh, in the current uh, world, uh, a building like that on its own uh, can never hope to uh, be sufficiently uh, kind of compelling or um, so that we made it compelling in all its seriousness by making a turn uh, and, and of course the turn could be a 24 hour turn so that it could uh, avoid solar uh, uh, exposure in its entirety and so that the kind of heat gain of this kind of plate could make a turn in itself on its own. So this was our, basically our aggressive commitment to stopping the kind of madness. Uh, and also we developed a kind of advertising campaign for it, uh, where in very simple language kind of we made the Zaha won the competition. Uh, and then kind of for a while there was a kind of uh, interesting project where we could be exiled from the heart uh, uh, to somewhere near the peri uh, periphery, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but that hasn't happened uh, so far. Now, together with engaging the kind of history of the Gulf and, and trying to intervene or frankly make history in the Gulf, we also are of course uh, exploring kind of on the kind of journalistic terms what uh, Dubai is about and perhaps we looked, uh, and we did look uh, in great detail uh, at uh, perhaps the most controversial issue, an issue that uh, Mark Davis has also uh, frequently kind of mentioned, the labor camps uh, under which the 
accommodation that the workers that make Dubai are enforced, forced to use. Everywhere and at regular moments you see in Dubai this landscape, basically workers either from China, from Pakistan, from India, from Sri Lanka, uh, now even from the Philippines, filing either in buses on arrival or on departure uh, and being shifted from the workplace to the accommodation. Dubai is 24 hours building. So we went to the accommodation and, and saw something that I think is very hard to explain uh, to the extent that what fascinates me in Dubai is that kind of where we you know, in our countries in Europe are completely um, traumatized by the ongoing integration or non-integration of uh, um, nationalities uh, and races that are not our own and where we in a way grown uh, under um, um, percentage of aliens uh, so-called or uh, of about uh, 10 and 20 percent that Dubai uh, contains only maybe 18 maximum 20 percent local people and that all the other ones are imports. We are used to think as the expat as a kind of white uh, figure, uh, an Australian, an American, a European, but of course uh, the vast majority of expats is, is all the other nations of Europe, oh sorry, of Asia and increasingly also of Africa that somehow uh, find uh, an accommodation here and also find of course an income here uh, which they don't have elsewhere. And as you go to the kind of work camps, you can look at it two, in two different ways. Either uh, kind of uh, a situation of intolerable harshness, or you can look at it at a situation that is not unsimilar or not dissimilar to the situation that these workers leave behind. With the difference, of course, that they get income that in their own countries they could not have. So uh, for anyone like me who's kind of lived in Indonesia, this kind of landscape of a kind of kampung, almost village, is kind of very familiar and, and all its arrangements are, are also very familiar and therefore perhaps the way in which this is used as the kind of most aggressive thing, uh, negative thing about Dubai, uh, show uh, again a kind of Eurocentric or Western-centric condition uh, only. Or, or point of view only. Um, since we're in Dubai, we are kind of not, of course, trying to only kind of build new things, but, but also see whether it is possible even in this kind of alien or apparently alien condition to do things that are more uh, complex. Uh, and kind of currently we're looking at these are four conditions that were planned for low-income uh, Emirate nationals uh, in Dubai uh, to see whether we can get involved in uh, preservation. Uh, everyone knows that kind of since a few years our office is also interested in preservation, not as the kind of counter, the counter opposition to uh, modernization, but actually as its complementary uh, essence. And so we are thinking of perhaps trying to work on one of these areas that are uh, very regular uh, and kind of minimalistic in terms of their urbanism, but also very beautiful, uh, and whether you could do or find a way in which an area like this, uh, which is in, in its stark contrast uh, actually really vivid uh, and um, touching in its immediacy, uh, which contains actually kind of very many kind of empty patches, whether you could actually work on that and create a kind of situation there that eventually if the rest of the city goes on as it does, uh, you can find a kind of more subtle area. Another kind of thing that we're uh, kind of looking at is this is a kind of former uh, project by uh, Christo or current project by Christo that he proposed in 74. Uh, and must have a pyramid of empty oil cans, whether we can kind of place that in certain kind of positions and, and make that work too. So what we're trying to do is actually kind of really 
uh, make a, a very intense effort to uh, show and to explore whether a situation like Dubai, which is you now almost universally considered like a kind of uh, a, a situation of absolute absurdity, whether uh, it is possible to develop a repertoire in which serious um, projects can happen. Now, um, one of the kind of most notorious kind of projects uh, is a project um, for an entirely new city by, by Nakio, and we've recently, this is the kind of planning so far, um, and in that planning there is supposed to be a kind of CBD here, and recently we, uh, this is the kind of sketch of the CBD with kind of only one major feature, which was a kilometer tall tower, but it turned out to be in the flight path uh, of the uh, new airport, and therefore uh, had to be kind of eliminated. And so basically, um, instead of this uh, endless kind of area, uh, we are now kind of, kind of proposing, and, and this uh, almost carpet of uh, featureless uh, um, elements, we are trying to work on the kind of hypothesis that the CBD could be uh, a, a very dense uh, island surrounded by a buffer, town, bu buffer zone, and that on that dense island we could have a, a series of central kind of features like metro, uh, like public transport, uh, all the elements that are typically non-existent in Dubai, but which are uh, in to say, to put it uh, mildly, in the pipeline, being worked on and being sought out. So actually our proposal for the CBD is then a kind of highly concentrated, highly developed and highly serviced uh, uh, section of the city where that uh, density could take place. Now, whether we want to or not, um, the iconic has become an inevitable and unavoidable kind of issue. Uh, it is perhaps, uh, I think, our collective uh, guilt uh, that somehow we have been uh, complicit in kind of reducing the issues of architecture uh, in the end to mere shape. Uh, God knows that our officers tried to kind of really resist it, but uh, our resistance has been kind of mostly futile. So uh, that really engages us also in, in shape, although of course in these shapes we haven't uh, kind of abandoned our interest in, in program and our priority in program. So for this island we now officially have to kind of think of an icon strategy <laughs> uh, that uh, is uh, able to uh, create the kind of semantic uh, airspace, uh, I would say, to, for the other elements to, to grow there. And perhaps it is also given the interchangeability uh, of, of good and bad architecture at this moment, uh, a kind of significant and interesting effort to see whether you can locate and place certain very special buildings to give the larger whole uh, a certain significance. So that kind of maybe uh, in the end there uh, we will all be competing on a kind of incredibly limited territory uh, uh, and that will be in itself uh, a feature. Anyway, so the history of architecture is now going, going from simple to complex. Uh, as another effort in Dubai, we want to go from s complex to simple. And we are announcing that kind of our office has now uh, created a new department called Generics where in the same uh, vein that certain medicines can be copyright free and, and have the same performance but without the status, uh, that, they can, that we are also interested in developing that kind of building as we're doing here, an office building and a housing building of the most abstract and simple kind, uh, where we use even kind of the debased materials as bronze glass and see whether we can create uh, beauty uh, uh, out of those. Also a project that uh, I'm doing with uh, Fernando Donis. Uh, okay, uh, on, uh, we are also working in a, an area called uh, Russia Karma, 
where the typical seaside uh, is, is kind of emerging and where we were looked uh, to look at the kind of incredible development here, which was uh, done by Halcro, uh, a colossal uh, four kilometer long uh, meadow in the heart of the desert uh, with only 32% um, uh, percent built and where we uh, basically made an argument uh, with the Sheikh that kind of uh, grass or lawns in this environment are criminal because in order to uh, feed uh, that area of the plant with rainwater you would have 24 million years of rain of the uh, of that uh, particular area so uh, utterly irresponsible and where we showed that kind of basically we could take every single element here and, and condense it uh, in uh, actually what could be a very beautiful uh, concentration which also participated in uh, kind of densities and proximities very close to uh, Arab history and also able to emulate kind of some of the Arabic uh, strategies to deal with uh, climate and Uh, there again, we needed uh, an icon and a feature. Uh, a this is the feature, uh, and this is the performing thing, a convention center, exhibition center, uh, on their own in the desert. And this is the winning project uh, by Snohetta <laughs> uh, in uh, Norway. Uh, and this is normal. Foster's kind of city in Dubai, uh, in Abu Dhabi, kind of announced uh, three weeks ago, uh, uh, kind of sustainable city. Um, I want to end uh, with a kind of small announcement uh, that uh, after 10 years of kind of effort, uh, uh, we are publishing the book on labels, uh, and, and that kind of we've been able to publish it because we kind of finally understood what Lego was, was about uh, and uh, understood what had been happening there. So it's kind of really, in to some extent, a rewriting, a complete rewriting uh, of the narrative. Uh, and that the rewriting is very necessary because, uh, as I will show, uh, even that, uh, looking at Lagos was part of the same kind of relentless criticism uh, not only of architectures in general but specifically of our office. Um, there, there was a well-known, uh, there is one um, journalist who published in uh, uh, the New Yorker not long ago, George Parker, who also is a kind of reporter in Iraq, very strong reporter. And basically, this is the, uh, his article about Lagos, and this is the illustration. And for me, it's an incredible, sorry, an incredibly interesting illustration because it, it s shows, just as the, the Mike Davises of the world, you know, used the one-liner of, of Speer and Disneyland to uh, be done with uh, significant areas uh, that uh, undergo drastic um, modernization, but, but also set the tone for uh, what architecture is today. Here too, I think the received way of looking at the labels is perfectly expressed in this picture, i.e. it is a sad situation. Uh, the women in this picture are victims, clearly, and they're passive and they're in a desperate uh, situation, and there is kind of nothing that makes you think of a traditional city, uh, and, and clearly uh, there is no possible trajectory that this situation could ever amount to something better. And, and so if you think that about Lagos, that is kind of basically okay. Now, in an essay, which actually wasn't an essay, uh, and this is a quote from the same article, Remkul described how his team on its first visit to the city was too intimidated to leave its car. Eventually, the group rented the Nigerian president's helicopter and was granted a more reassuring view. So then it quotes uh, my reassuring view, and then the impulse to look at an apparently burning gar garbage heap 
and see an urban phenomenon and then make it the raw material of an elaborate aesthetic construct is not so different from the more common impulse not to look at all. So anyway, they're kind of basically looking at, at Lagos has, has really cost us in terms of uh, uh, integrity and, and acceptability and the caricature has been of a kind of series of cowardly people never uh, leaving the car uh, until the moment that uh, helicopter brought to leave and, and uh, allowed us a kind of uh, bird's eye view in all kind of security. Now, uh, this is my portrait of uh, uh, Lagos, kind of clearly not taken uh, from the car, actually uh, I was on foot here, uh, in the center of the biggest garbage dump in the city. And basically I was looking at the garbage uh, and, and in the beginning totally focused on the garbage, but it's only later that I kind of realized that there was also a lot of modern infrastructure in this picture and that perhaps the combination of the two was not a uh, coincidence. And so I've been looking at, at, at all our earlier pictures uh, and kind of basically coming slowly to the same conclusion that for instance here, this is a village on a, a garbage heap, that this is perhaps also kind of forms not of desperation, but of intelligence if you have no uh, money to pay for transport, that you live on the uh, uh, ground that actually uh, performs or delivers your economy. Uh, and basically this picture, which I've shown perhaps here kind of maybe three times, first as an inexplicable density of people on an inexplicable point. But if you look at it carefully with what I know now, this is the site of a railway line that actually passes to twice a day and delivers people. Um, it is slowed down by the people to the point that uh, in its passage, uh, it acts like an exchange uh, between the sellers and the buyers. And that in the same way, there is an enormous amount of infrastructure here. And that where first I thought that we were in Lagos uh, witness of a kind of system of self-organization. Uh, of course, 10 years, a kind of very popular theory, chaos theory in self-organization, that actually this uh, concentration was enabled by infrastructure that kind of somehow had been built there. And so now the, what we have been trying kind of very hard is to find the authors uh, of that infrastructure and kind of find the motivations of that infrastructure so that we can now kind of really look at what the interaction is between that infrastructure and the current life in Lagos uh, and whether that is a negative interaction or in the end perhaps still a positive interaction. Here we see a kind of colossal German wrist. Uh, uh, take, take an island, one of the components uh, of Lagos, and turn it in entirely into a kind of high accessible by cars island. It was built in the kind of 80s. Uh, and then we see that kind of in the corners, there is also not only a kind of dump, which I thought first, but actually a kind of process where the rubbish is turned into products uh, in a kind of very highly organized and systematic way. Here we were able to plan and to see that every single square meter of this intersection is actually used in a very intense way. And that kind of there's not only the organization of the uh, infrastructure, not only the flow of the kind of public transport, but also the ability to kind of exploit these conditions and, and create uh, a very highly organized life. So if you imagine the um, the picture of the three women and compare it with this picture, which is kind of really an, of a highly active system that is not sitting there in a kind of state of despair, but, but actually turning that uh, condition in a kind of very kind of productive uh, effort and productive life. Uh, and the theory is uh, kind of in the end that that productive life is still enabled, no matter how far you have to go back uh, in terms of the decay of, of Lagos, still enabled by this original infrastructure. This is another kind of typical moment which seems uh, at close, uh, at first sight, uh, some kind of desperate uh, slum, 
where people live half in the water. But if you see it here, here it is also um, a kind of very vigorous process of turning kind of trees into planks and using the uh, residue to create new land, uh, which is again kind of uh, unthinkable without the proximity uh, of the infrastructure. Here, a garbage dump uh, with kind of supposedly desperate people uh, doing anything, but actually from above, our famous helicopter look and highly organized, structured and architecture, architectural entity. And so perhaps the most kind of stunning kind of example of this is this is a kind of recent uh, incredible uh, explosion uh, of car parts, uh, market for car parts only, because the economy of uh, Nigeria depends uh, not on new important new cars, but of maintaining all the cars that exist there forever. Car parts are the most crucial part. But what we discovered is that kind of at the core here is actually a larger project uh, designed in the 70s by uh, a Yugoslav then project, uh, Energo project, which consisted uh, of 2,000 architects who, uh, as part of the non-aligned movement, would descend on uh, countries like Lagos and, and create, in this case, uh, a highly artistic uh, project for a trade fair. You see the kind of uh, different clusters that were realized. Um, here you see the original kind of project, uh, extremely beautiful with kind of re really extreme landscape uh, areas that could also be used for temporary uh, architecture. The success in this uh, tropical uh, condition, uh, the beauty of the coherence, the in a way modernity uh, of the architecture, the uh, guts uh, of the authors, uh, the festivities at the opening uh, and then the kind of tragedy of the decay and the non-use. But as I showed before, it then kind of becomes again the new beginning of uh, another effort. So this is, was for me kind of really where kind of the Legos project uh, in the end you know, turns uh, and, and completes the circle um, in the sense that kind of underlying this kind of apparent um, melancholy and, and kind of sadness of the city and, and, and desperation of the city, there is actually still this kind of modernist blueprint uh, for uh, an entirely new city in Africa, uh, perhaps in the same way as we are collectively making blueprints for uh, Dubai, uh, appropriated rather than um, appropriate by the population rather than the population being its victim, uh, I think, and, and therefore, in the end, perhaps uh, an example of a kind of successful uh, effort at uh, turning and changing a part in the world in, in spite of its apparent uh, desperation. Thank you. Maybe we can get a microphone up here for a, for a couple of questions afterwards. Rim, thanks very much. Um, and while Juliet is bringing up the microphone, let me ask, it's, it's interesting to see the Lagos brought back in, um, which I know you've presented here in the past. In the last couple of years, you've been working in other areas. But one of the interesting things about the Lagos work is, is in, in a way that it, sh that it shifts attention towards, towards something that didn't appear in a lot of the discussion early on in the talk, which is in, in effect the landscape. Mm -hmm. you, you touched on the, on, the, on the impulse of preservation suddenly, and, and I thought, you know, in the area of work within Dubai, and, and I'm wondering if there's a category of work, and with maybe within the office or in the research in which the landscape again is becoming a kind of topic to marry to some of the other interests and concerns. I'm thinking of something like the role Lavalette mm -hmm. might have played as a project, which was interesting, although very European in its mm -hmm image of landscape, i.e. the rethinking of a mm. historical park, but that, in effect, tipping of the building down onto the surface, and that, uh, that, that there might be something in the work that's now bringing landscape back into uh, uh, analysis. Well, I think it's a kind of interesting, um, in interesting uh, theory, uh, and uh, I, I would have to say, I think that the, the, the triumph of landscape in the kind of in the last uh, 10 years is kind of simply 
the direct uh, uh, inverse is inverse proportion with the failure of architecture, and uh, uh, and and um, and basically, I think that the landscape has been uh, kind of incredibly patient and smooth way of kind of organizing kind of certain uh, phenomena. Uh, that architecture has incredible turbo and and currently also no imagination to deal with, uh, and and so. Um, I think that, that that is all there is to say about it. And you, you can, yes, you can look at uh, this as a landscape, and I do look at, the, uh, at it as a landscape, and as a landscape that performs I in a way that kind of almost no recent kind of urban condi condition or prototype kind of can perform. And it, 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 it can perform because it has no kind of physical kind of limitations and doesn't impose a kind of regime. Uh, doesn't impose its kind of values with the same kind of inevitable dogmatism, uh, and of course, it's uh, kind of infinitely more cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, as the, the basically the initiative shifts to uh, zones that are less uh, affluent uh, uh, and, and, and basically less materialistic, uh, I, I'm sure it will have a kind of fantastic future. Yeah. Um, so I take some questions. Anybody questions? With your work in Dubai, you talked about um, having to create almost kind of token iconic buildings in order to, um, quote, create semantic airspace for other elements to grow there. Do you think you actually need these icons in order to create that semantic space, or can the kind of generic, organic parts of the city grow without those icons? Well, I, thi I think b basically the organic grow doesn't grow in Dubai. Yeah, so it, it's kind of largely uh, an incredibly artificial construct. And so therefore, hoping for an organic uh, kind of emergence of, of kind of values and, and coherence, uh, I think, uh, doesn't uh, really work. Uh, and so um, what we're trying to do is to take the issue of the icon and iconicity seriously. And uh, I think that uh, you can kind of predict that somehow the incredible cacophony that, that we generate uh, kind of together and, and also the, the kind of current competition where, where basically every building doesn't have a kind of enhancing effect on any other building but basically cancels it out through uh, kind of perverse similarities uh, and, and, and equally futile, futile uh, efforts at uh, differentiation or increasingly desperate uh, efforts at differentiation that there is great future for the ge generic again, you know, like for kind of m almost Messian neutrality and uh, nothingness, and perhaps on the other hand, for uh, cert certain uh, very special buildings that address that situation in a very deliberate way, by position and by having a kind of grip. That's why I talk about airspace. It's kind of like. Like beacon, but I'm, th that's something I'm not sure uh, about. That which we're trying. Questions? This one in the back. No. Okay. Uh, I'll say it now. I mean. No problem. Um, it, it's just uh, I mean it's just to announce here that that kind of uh, as as a kind of final that simply I mean it's kind of really poor. There, there were three lectures I could give. One was about preservation. Uh, this is uh, the other one was about everything that is going on in the office at any one time, and this was a concentration on this silk belt. So uh, Welbeck has nothing to do with it, but. Basically, uh, he, he's uh, doing uh, a f movie about his uh, last book, Possibilité d'une île, and he has asked me to uh, do the sets. And, uh, and basically, uh, the sets have to uh, be uh, serve only one purpose, uh, to convey a modern city, uh, in Welbeck's words, uh, Le Corbusier won, uh, and, uh, and uh, that is hit by an earthquake and then kind of inundated to perish uh, and disappear forever. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe one last question, is there? <laughs>